This meeting is being recorded. Okay. We can start, Nick. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I have the honor and the privilege to introduce our guest speaker, Kelvin Montero. He born and raised in Vancouver. And he also has uh, nearly 20 years of experience uh, in leadership and executive roles. Kelvin have been tackled various luxury hotels brands on the operation side, restaurants and business marketing as well. And in his most recent chapter, Kelvin has led uh, the opening of senior living residence as general manager and regional, regional director. Uh, Kelvin also has been member of very uh, several organizations uh, for example canadian Tourism college accenda school of management uh, mpi international panelists and uh, among others and since to, since 2020 he's been speaking at nearly 40 conference conferences as virtual meetings and kelvin also he's the founder of Montero, Cons Montero Consulting Group and his new role as a vice president of Van Bell Nursery, where he's located in Apples for BC. So, helping me welcome to Kelvin Montero and Kelvin, the scenario is all yours. Thanks so much. I appreciate it, Richard. So, after that introduction, I feel old. I feel like I've done a lot of stuff that I, I didn't even remember that I did. But no, it's funny, guys, because we've all been in that position that we're looking to grow, we're looking to be leaders, we're looking to develop in our lives. And I'll tell you, it really is humbling after all the hard work and all the networking and all the leadership that, you know, when I do hear my introduction, I was in your seats 15 to 20 years ago. I was there. And it's pretty cool because I'm not any smarter. I don't have any more experience, any more contacts. No one gave me free jobs. I just took some tips. I worked with mentors and you have to work hard, obviously, right? So I think my presentation today, what I'd like to do, Nick and I think Richard and maybe a few others that might know me, you'll know this about me. I'm gonna do a fairly short presentation because you guys are in class a lot. You guys see lots of presentation. What I'd like to do is I wanna kind of get through the information in maybe 15 minutes and then I want to have a really open Q&A. I want to have a conversation. I want to pitch some questions to you guys. And I want you to start thinking through what questions do you have around leadership, around how to get that next job, around how do I set myself apart, around building your brand, anything you can think of. And again, I'm not the expert. I am someone that can maybe give you some information to lead you in the right direction. But I want you to start thinking of questions, OK? because I'm not going to take up an hour to present to you. Um, I want to make this a, a two-way street. So I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, share my screen here. So I won't be able to see you. So if you have a question or anything in, in the meantime, you'll have, to, uh, you'll have to just say it. So can someone just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, Perfect. you can see it. Excellent. So guys, I'm going to, I'm going to share with you what I believe are the five stages to leadership. So if you've never been a leader before, and you're going to go into your first lead position, supervisory position, you're likely going to start around step one. If you've led teams for a while and people are following you and you're doing quite well in your leadership journey, you're probably somewhere between step three and four, but step five, those are those leaders that people are dying to work with them. They're the ones that when they leave a job, people follow them. And I'm going to share with you guys a few tips in terms of how to move from leadership style level one all the way through to five. Okay. So the first thing is, what's the meaning of leadership? Well, leadership is the ability to lead, to guide, 
direct or influence people. This is very different than telling people what to do, than making people do things. That's management, right? If I'm your boss and I say, you need to clean the toilet or you're in trouble, that's not leadership. Leadership is, is asking someone, what do you think you need to do today to make our business better? And they say, you know what? I'm gonna go clean the toilets. So what is leadership not? What are the things that are not becoming of a leader? Well, not taking time to bond with people, being unavailable, being inaccessible, not developing people, not giving regular feedback or giving people kind of performance notes, not taking people's emotions into account. So if someone's crying because they just split up from their partner, you thinking, you know what, you still need to get to work. Managing conflict poorly. So when you get feedback from people and when you're hearing that there's challenges in the workplace, you don't choose to fix those challenges. Not being a driver of change and not encouraging people to be the best they can be or take risks. So that's what leadership is not. Here's the biggest difference, and you can read a th literally a thousand books on leadership. The biggest difference between management and leadership is that people follow you because they have to rather than because they want to. That's a manager. Like, I have to listen to my boss. I have to do this because if not, I get in trouble, right? Leadership is saying that it's not the position that makes the leader. It's the leader that makes the position. So guys, the first tip here, as we kind of show a few examples, and you might have seen this graphic before, to show a few examples is you don't want people listening to you and following you because they have to. You want them following you because they actually want to work for you and want to work with you. So I'm not going to reach e each of these, but a few of these things are like, if you are a leader and something goes really well, you say, hey guys, we did this versus saying, oh, I accomplished this. Another big one that a boss or a manager does is they know how it's done. So they'll say, yeah, you got to get this done and it's due tomorrow. A leader will actually show you how to get it done and they'll actually develop people and they get people inspired and they're, they're really in, into it for the people that they're serving. So those are just a couple of examples. Now, step one of leadership is you are a leader because you have the title. So step one is you're a leader based on position. So it's usually given to people because you have some potential. They're giving you a bit of authority. They think that you can grow. And they think that by giving you this position, we're going to be able to help shape and define your leadership. So step one, when you first become a leader, or that first level is, you're only a leader because of your title. Okay? I'm not going to read through all these again, but the downside of position is that people just use their title to be a manager. They often find that they feed on politics. They often will only treat people with respect because they have a title. So what you wanna do is you wanna start looking at not relying on your position to push people. So if you're gonna go in as a supervisor in a hotel, you don't wanna be saying to people, you must do this because I'm your supervisor. So number one is stop relying on your position to push people. Number two, is treat the enti entitlement for movement. So what that means is, instead of being excited about your title, worry more about moving your team and guiding your team than looking good as a manager. And then the third thing is, don't worry so much about your position, focus more on getting on the front lines with your teams. So again, if you're a supervisor at a hotel, go and spend time at the front desk with your team. Go and clean some rooms with the housekeeper. Leave your position and start spending more time with people. Why? Because that'll get you to level two of leadership. Level two of leadership is where titles are no longer enough. That you start realizing that people are actually the value, not the position. You also realize that leaders don't need to have all the answers. Usually at level one, because it's your position, you think you have to know everything. Once you get to level two, you're humble, humble enough to know that you don't have to have all the answers. 
and that you always want to include others when you get to level two. So level two is you can't lead people until you like people. So level one, remember, I'm managing people because I have the title. Level two is I've now recognized that for me to be a good leader, I actually have to like people. I have to want to serve people and that really they're my boss because they're going to tell me what guidance they need and what support they need. So what happens when you get to level two? Well, it makes work more enjoyable because you like people. There's better energy. There's better communication. You're starting to value each person on your team, which is going to create trust. The downside is when you start caring about people, sometimes people will seem like they're a little bit too soft, like they care too much. Some people that like to just get the job done, they start saying, oh man, Calvin is so focused on asking about our feelings and spending time with us. I just want to get the answer. Some people, when they get to this level, they get taken advantage of because they give people too many opportunities. So yes, there's upsides and downsides of starting to care about people, but this is how you start getting towards level three. So make sure that you're always practicing the golden rule. And for those of you that don't know what the golden rule is, well, even as a manager or a leader, treat your team the way that you want to be treated. So if you're going to ask someone to do something, you have to be just as eager and able and willing to do that job yourself. Strike a balance between care and candor. And what that means is it's important to care about your team, but you also have to re expect results out of them. And that's where we start slowly moving to level three. When you're moving to level three leadership, you're thinking, wait a second, relationships are not enough. Building relationships require both of us to be successful. And how do we now achieve a vision? This is where most of you will land in the first few years, I hope, of your career. Is remember, number one, you have the position. Number two, you care about people. Now you need to produce. You have to showcase results through people. People will follow you because what you've done in our organization. They'll say, man, Calvin's really good at this. Look at our numbers. Look at the people that he's hired. Now you have results to start showcasing why you're a level three or a tier three leader. So again, some examples, when you can prove that your business is running well, now you have credibility. Now you create standards. Now you have clarity. Now you're able to solve problems. Now you're able to actually team build and create momentum for your business. But like I mentioned before, there's always downsides. Now the weight of being a leader becomes more challenging. Why? Because now people expect results out of you. You have more responsibility. You have to make more difficult decisions. It demands more attention than level two did. These are the best behaviors when you're kind of in the middle of your leadership journey. You wanna understand how you contribute to the vision. You wanna to begin to develop people. You want to prioritize things that will actually yield positive results. You want to be willing to make changes. And now at level three, you're actually having to watch the results and drive the results or the goals. And, you know, guys, I know that there's lots of steps and, you know, you're probably going, well, like, how does this relate to me? Because every presentation or book that you read, they just talk about leadership. And I'm just trying to break it down so it's not so scary. You have different levels of leadership. They're going to take you lots of time to go from one to the other. So you don't have to worry about being this big, overachieving leader and people loving to work for you. It's going to take time and you're going to have to recognize different steps. <clears throat> now you get to the fourth step. This to me is the biggest step in leadership. Some of you may have been here before, but you definitely know those people that you've worked for or professors at school or mentors, you know the people that are at this level. Level four is a level where you actually start developing people. So you have the position, you're starting to do some good work, you're able to create business results. So now you have time to develop people around you. And 
What's really neat about this phase is this is what's going to set you apart from most other people. This is what's going to guarantee that growth can be sustained. Like imagine if you're really good at your job, but then you get sick. Or I'm sure you've seen businesses where one person quits and all of a sudden everyone's struggling. Oh my gosh, John left. Now we can't do this anymore because John was the expert. Yeah, but if John trained people and if we had a sustainable path and we develop people, this wouldn't be an issue. This also may, means that you're empowering people. You're thinking about the future. You're thinking about the ability to be the best person that they can be. And, you know, what's interesting about this is the downside is most people are insecure to develop people. And I bet a few of you have been through this before where your boss is not developing you. They're not helping you. They're not driving you. Maybe because they're scared you're going to take their job. Or maybe because they're nervous that you're smarter than them. When you're at this level as a leader, you've got the position, you've got the results, you have the vision, you can't be nervous that you're going to develop people to be smarter and better than you. Because that is your job as a people leader. Here's some of the best behaviors. If you want to get yourself to the top, top, top of leadership, you're making sure you always find the best people. You're making sure you always put the right people in the right position. You're always modeling great behavior. You're showing people what leadership looks like. You're giving people the tools they need to do their jobs well, which I call equipping. Now you're teaching them to do life well, developing them. And this number five is important, guys, because we're not just trying, when you're at this level of leadership, you're also now trying to help people with their home life, with their finances, with their friends, with their career. You are now a support system for your team. Six, you're always empowering them. You want them to succeed. And lastly, you always evaluate those people to make sure that what they're doing and the energy that they're putting in is valuable. Now, you've done this. You are now at the pinnacle of your career. You're saying, how do I go to that last level? How do I become the CEO? How do I become that person that everybody wants to follow? The highest goal of leadership is simply to develop leaders. It's not about having friends at work or gaining followers. It's about developing people. To develop leaders, you must create a leadership culture. And frankly, it is a life commitment. It's having coffee with people on a Saturday. It's doing presentations for colleagues. It's stepping in when someone's sick, right? And this is what it's called, guys. It's called the pinnacle. And this is where people follow you because of who you are and what you represent. So imagine being that leader that you move industries. You're a GM at a hotel, and now you're going to go and be the, the vice president of a car manufacturer. Very different industries. When you're at a level five, when people want to follow you, they're going to go there because they believe in who you are and what you represent. They know they're going to be taken care of. They know that you're always going to look at the right morals and values, and they know they're going to be successful. This is the absolute pinnacle of your career. Now, I broke it out into five steps simply because we don't expect people to be able to do this right away. This, this isn't something that happens overnight or happens in your first year in your career. First, you got to start by getting the position, then start getting some buy-in from people, then make sure you're actually able to achieve goals with people, then develop those people, and then make sure that when you leave, if you leave, or whatever you do, that those people will always follow you because of who you are and your moral standards, right? So like I said, I wanted to have a very quick presentation. I'm a very kind of fast, act, fast action guy. So what questions do you guys have? What, what may you be curious about or wonder about leadership? Um, it could be around getting, getting into the job market. Um, anything that you think that I might be able to support you with, I'd be more than glad to do my best to answer. I think Richard's got his hand up. Yeah, thanks, Calvin, once again for this uh, 
opportunity to hear to hear your, your all the information that we have all to develop. My question is, what is why is important as a leader to give feedback to our team? Great question. It's important because if you don't give them feedback, you can't expect people to be better, right? I see a lot of managers that say, oh my gosh, Sally the server is the worst. And I go, okay, did you talk to Sally? Did you, did you tell her that the way she sets tables isn't very good and the way that she hands the foods to your customers isn't good? Well, I'm just so busy. Well, then you can't be mad at Sally. You need to be mad at yourself, right? Leadership requires difficult conversations. Leadership requires you to put yourself in their position. If you were the server, would you want your boss to give you the right feedback and to train you? Of course. The problem is most people don't want to make the time or they're nervous to have difficult conversations or they don't know how to fix the problem. Lots of bosses will say, oh, this person isn't good. But inside they're thinking, I don't actually know how to fix this. So instead, they just rather make fun of the team member or fire them. That's a good question. Thank you, Kelvin. Um, hi, Kelvin. I have another question. Sure, um, thank you for your time and your thoughts. Uh, they're really important for us. And my question is, um, what will be a, an important key when you are the leader um, with people that it's older than you? It's a difficult change and it's difficult to gain respect or to be here. And it's becoming like normal right now in yeah. this generation. Well, believe it or not, I know probably compared to most of you, I look very old, but I've, I've always been kind of young in my positions. And so I've dealt with this challenge many, many times. And I think the best thing that you can do as a younger leader is have proof, what I call proof in the pudding. Be willing to do the work. Be willing to get on the front lines with people and help them and support them. When you can show someone that you're willing to do the work with them, your age, your education becomes very, very, very minimal. Now they actually trust in you. But if you come into a job and you just tell people what to do all the time, they are initially looking at you saying, why is Tanya telling me what to do? She's half my age. But if Tanya's in the front lines and she's helping and she's working a little harder and she's offering support and you're constantly asking people, do you have the tools you need? How are you feeling today? Do you need anything from me? How can I help you? You're constantly doing that. They're going, wow, Tanya is young, but she's pretty wise. Like she's always checking up on us. She actually cares. See, the more that somebody cares about you, the more mistakes you're allowed to make, right? Imagine some of the things maybe you've done at home or with your partner, with your parents. Imagine if you did that with someone you met for the first time, they'd probably never talk to you again. But because of relationship, your team will always give you more space to make mistakes as a leader. But if you go in there and you just push them and push them and push them from day one, they're going to give you no space to make mistakes. They're going to be on top of you and they're going to judge you based on your age. I think there was a, maybe a question in the chat box here. How do you tell someone if they're not consistent? Well, you guys are going to laugh, but you tell them that they're not consistent. So the, the most important thing, guys, is that you actively have proactive conversations. So if Nick screws something up as a teacher or as an administrator and, and, and Neil sits down with him a year later, is that fair? Hey, Nick, a year ago, that presentation was really bad. I didn't like it. And your, your consistency is slipping. No. So you yourself have to be consistent with the feedback. So how do you breed consistency on your team? You yourself have to be consistent. So for me, everyone that's ever reported to me, we always have a one-on-one -on -one every two weeks. It's 15 to 20 minutes. We check in, they give me feedback. I give them feedback and we review expectations. And because it's in the calendar and it's scheduled, we come together and we have a very important conversation versus, oh yeah, um, Hopefully I see John this week. I should really tell him this. Then you get busy and then John gets sick. 
put it in your calendar and make sure you talk to everyone that reports to you at least every couple of weeks. Sergio. Sergio is on mute. Oh, there we go. Yeah, hi. Uh, right now I'm team leader at Mountain Warehouse. I used to be team leader uh, back at home and some other companies, but how do you get involved with the new team, get to know each other when you are the new guy, let's say. But what's the, not the easy way, but what's your best advice? Yeah, really good question, because you're all probably going to experience this, right? You're going to go and join a new team. You're like, how do I connect with people? First tip is make sure that you don't just ask what I call surface level questions. Don't just do the morning. How are you? Good. Start focusing on asking in-depth questions. Hey, how was your weekend? Oh, weekend's pretty good. Oh yeah, do, do you have kids? Where, whereabouts do you live? What types of things do you like to do? Like when you actually start caring about people and asking questions to get to know them, all of a sudden they're gonna wanna get to know you, right? So that's tip number one is don't just ask simple surface level questions. The second thing is there's generally when you join a team, there's someone that is almost like the popular kid. They're the person that they do the events or that everyone circles around them or they have a lot of power. Find a way to build a strong relationship with that person. Because whether we like it or not, these people exist in schools, they exist in the workplace, they exist in families, right? You have to find a way to be noticed by this person. And I'm not saying to be fake or to suck up to them. Do your best naturally to build a relationship with them because they're the ones that are going to plan the events. They're the ones that are going to maybe look at the schedules. They're going to be the ones that people follow. But the third thing is, as you build that reputation and as you get a bit more comfortable, offer suggestions to do team building events. Hey guys, I was thinking maybe in three weeks from now, let, let's do like some bowling for Christmas time. Like let's, I'm, I'm happy to organize it right? Offer, offer to take that work on. I can do a poster. I can make sure everyone signs up and maybe let's all go do something in a few weeks or a dinner. That time out of work is so important, right? I don't know if you guys will agree or if you've, you've had these experiences, you have dinner with your team. You're learning about things you've never heard about before. Questions are being asked. There's, you know, you're not constantly going, oh yeah, sorry, customer sir. Yeah. And just, right. Like you're actually able to sit down relax and talk to someone. So I would say the third tip would be to try to find a way to spend time with people that you're working with because they are, they are people you're going to spend as much, if not more time with in your own family. Rebecca has a question. Rebecca, you're in a really dark room. <laughs> Rebecca, we can't hear you. You are on mute. Oh, hi. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Actually, I have two questions. <laughs> First, uh, when you have the right person in the right position, how do you keep them motivated? Because sometimes the work will be very stressful and very hard. And how do you keep motivated for a long term? Because if you are training people for long term, this could be really challenging. And my second question is, um, how do you uh, build this kind of relationships? Because I, in my opinion, it's, too, it's hard to be a leadership in the way that you have to be strong, but you, be, you have to be kind. And how do you uh, create that balance? Thank Great you. questions. So, I'm going to ask you a question, Rebecca. So you might have to, to, to come off mute. Yeah. Are you are you in a relationship now? Like married or boyfriend, girlfriend? Are you in a relationship? Yes, I'm married. Okay. So how do you keep your marriage engaged? What do you um, do to care about your, your partner? Communication. You, you communicate? Okay. What else? Uh, uh, do um, fun, funny stuff. You try to find ways to enjoy time together, right? 
Exactly, yes. And yeah, communicate a lot and talk and, and have fun for both of us, not only for me. <laughs> yeah, and do you, do you guys like, do you guys plan for the future together? Like, you know, maybe yeah. a trip one day or your retirement goals, whatever that is? Exactly, yes. Yeah, so my, my, my question back to the whole group here is, uh, why is it that we don't do this with our teams? Like, why don't we treat our teams the same way as we treat people we love? We're going to spend the same amount of time with them, if not more. These are the people that are going to help us save the money to help our relationship, to help our goals. So just like Rebecca said, you, you've answered your own question. How do you motivate the people that you work with or that you work alongside? Communicate with them. Show them that you care. Listen to them. Treat them like they're someone that you actually want to be in a relationship with, right? People want to work with people that they care about. It's that simple. If you don't like your boss, even if your boss is super smart and really good at their job, you will not want to work with them. And people do not quit companies. They quit managers, right? Very few people go, I'm going to quit um, working at Safeway because I hate Safeway. No, they quit Safeway because their boss, Linda, sucks. That's why they're quitting Safeway. So, but if Linda cares about you and she's checking in and she listens and she cares, the odds are really, really high that they're going to give you a break when you make mistakes and they're going to care about you the same way that you care about them. So I know that um, those of you that have worked with me in past or have coached with me, I talk a lot about leadership being very, very similar to relationships. So think, think through that pattern. The second thing is you talked a bit about building relationships when you get busy, right? You've hired lots of people. How do you maintain it? Not unlike a business, you want to make this scalable. So imagine if you start leading a thousand people, right? Can you say good morning to all thousand people every day? Of course not. But can you find a method of communication to send a letter once a week, right? Can you try to connect with every person at least once a year? Can you find a way to meet with your directors every two weeks and then the rest of your teams later on? What are some consistent things that you can do to be consistent? That's the key. Like if you do one big lunch and then you don't talk to your team for the whole year, the lunch is never going to be enough. But if you're constantly checking in and communicating, find ways using your calendar, using Zoom, using different tools that can get you in front of all your teams as often as you want to show them that you care, just to check in with them. Like even take a forum like this, you can invite your team to something like this once a month and make, make it a Q&A around what's working for you and what isn't. And you can have a town hall just to get feedback. That one meeting is gonna show your team that you actually care. And then you have to action whatever it is that they're sharing with you, right? But use the, use the tools that we've learned so well in the last couple of years to support your team. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rebecca. I think Jessica has a question. Yeah, Heather was first. Oh, sorry. Heather, go ahead. Hi. Thank you, Jessica. So nice. Um, one question. You mentioned something about bonding with your team. It's very important, which I agree. Uh, but many of us come from different cultures. And for example, in the Latin American culture, uh, relationships in work, it's very common to become like very personal about jokes. Uh, we hug, we kiss. So <laughs> it's really very personal. We mm. know that in North uh, America culture, like Canada, like US, it's more impersonal. So for example, I will find like uh, to getting to know people, I agree that it's very interesting to get to know them and how's your family? Do you have kids? Tell me about what you do at the weekends. Some people might find it invasive or even offensive. And I've learned about people say, saying that, hey, it is work. It's not, uh, you're not my friend, you're not my family. Because it's a culture, it's a cultural thing. So uh, how would you measure this? Uh, when you are new at work, you are new at the culture, this is your first job. And let's imagine you start in this new position, being a manager and supervising people that are older than you and are all locals. So they grow in a different context. 
Great question. And and one of the things going back to like the town halls or the Zoom meetings, you can always actually I did this recently with another company. You can always start off when you start a new job by sending out a survey and asking people five questions. How do you like to be rewarded? How do you like to communicate? What are some of the things that you enjoy about work right now? What are some things you don't enjoy? And actually taking that survey and having a customized approach towards your team. This is a really easy, like the tools now are so easy. And 20 years ago, this was tough to do. It would cost you lots of money and time. Now you can do like a Google Sheets, it takes you two minutes and you're sending out a link to your team to say, hey, if you don't mind in the next week, I wanna to get to know you better. I wanna support you independently. And I want to make sure we have a customized approach. Uh, and I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that feedback. Now, in that feedback, you're going to see those people that are like, "No, kind of leave me alone. I'm good." And you're going to treat them somewhat like that. You know, "Good morning, Richard. Hope you're doing well. Anything you need from me today? Okay. Have a good day." Then you have someone else that goes, "I like to be appreciated in front of people. I like, you know, I, I want to be involved. I want to." And then you're going to take that relationship in a different direction, right? So surveys are a really easy way to do that and do it really quickly with no cost. Nice, thank you. No, you're welcome. And now it's actually Jessica's turn. Okay, thank you so much. You talk about the sometimes the company is not good for a leader. And do you think as a leader is valid to say, okay, it's not me, it's the company? Because sometimes as a leader, we are like uh, frustrated and trying that mood of a, as a challenge. And we are in that time becoming up obsessed with that. Like, no, I, I need to try to do the best, maybe in a different way, but you are all losing time and maybe you will be work better in another company. So as a leader is, is correct, say, okay, maybe I need to move. This is a tough question because every situation is different. I would say this, on average, we get frustrated with the company more times than we actually look at ourselves in the mirror. And I'm not saying that to you, Jessica, I just mean generally. Generally people say, oh, my boss sucks. Oh, I want more vacation. Oh, this is, and it's actually you're the problem because work isn't always fun. Work isn't always easy. Work isn't always a joy. But work should always be something that you go home and you say, okay, I had a good day. That should be the goal. And so I think everyone is going to reflect a little bit differently. But my suggestion is this. If you haven't at least sat down with your boss and told them how you feel, then you probably haven't done enough. But if you sat down with your boss and you said, listen, I don't like this. This isn't working for me. The culture, the hours, whatever it is, see what that answer is see what the feedback is and go from there. Because I think a lot of people get really upset and really frustrated, but they never give the company a chance to change because they're angry. They tell their friends, they tell their boyfriend, but they never told their boss. And their boss is the only person that can likely impact change. So I would start there. Now, if you don't get the answer you want, Jessica, then you start to question yourself and you go, okay, I was honest. I gave the feedback and they didn't care. Hmm. Do I think this is going to change or not? And if you think the answer is no, then yeah, I would look for another company. Hi, um, I have a question. It's more like a personal question because I'm, I'm the kind of person that I work, it's always making fun and I don't like to get bored. Well, I work in the restaurant industry, so... I'm always joking around with my coworkers and everything. So I can't imagine how I would be able to manage them. Look, so like in the future, if I wanted to apply for a leadership, um, a leader position, I don't see how they would even listen to me when in the past I was just like joking around and being funny all the time. Like, can it, can there be a balance between making jokes and like, yeah. Well, I don't know. yeah. The, the short answer is yeah. Like I think I'm pretty funny and I'm pretty outgoing and you notice I don't stop moving and I have this energy, but you have to think about it this way. If you don't think that they would follow you, they definitely won't follow you. So what are the shifts that you have to make for them to see you as a potential leader? 
So one example is, and and I don't know what type of a restaurant you're working at, but I'm sure you you know who makes the most sales in a night, as an example, right? So like you guys will you guys will print off your report at the end of the night. You should be one of the top sellers in the restaurant to get that respect, showing that you know how to sell the business and you're good at the business. Number two, I would look at in the in the restaurant industry, you better be the most flexible person in the restaurant. So when someone needs to pick up a shift or stay an extra hour or support the team or wash dishes, you should be the person doing that. So if you're doing some of those things, you can absolutely be playful and have fun. But if you're in a mode where I'm here to do my job, I laugh, I leave, they're gonna look at you as one of them and it's gonna be very hard for you to make that shift. So depending on where you're at, my focus would be, I wanna be the best server in the restaurant. I wanna be the most flexible person. And I'm always gonna look out for the best interests of the business. So I've always joked, I've run restaurants and hotels, but when it was time to do work and it was time to hit our metrics and help our guests and help the owners, you're always doing that first. So just making sure you have that blend is important, but you have to be the best first. Yeah, that's a really good answer. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Hi, Kevin. Um, my my hand was up. I just like loaded down. Um, I just want to... Oh, you might have frozen. Yeah. So thank you, first of all. Oh, I'm sorry. I, th I think you might have frozen. Do you mind repeating? Yeah, no, um, I was going to say that first, thank you for being here. We were very excited to be hosting this event. You are like, um, like you have that thing to get you inspired. So I like feel very inspired by you and all the words that you're saying and the learning I think has been like really nice. Um, my question was like very similar with the other question. I was just because we came from a culture where we are very friendly and I'm always just wondering the same. And I've been always wondering the same because um, it's, it's very easy for us to create and build relationships at work, but sometimes, you know, there is a point when you work with your friends and you love them, but at the same time, there are people who can know, like, make a difference between work and friendship, and sometimes when you're, like, doing the job of working, um, they kind of, like, not take advantage, but, yeah, do not make a difference between and I just wanted to know your approach at handling this and how you can still have friends, be working with them and, you know, but make people to do their job as well. Like, no, even like pushing them, but like make them aware that we're working and there are times for everything to work, to, you know, have fun and like to create that perfect balance between friendship and working. You know, and honestly, you know, you you asking the question again, almost in a different way, gives me another piece of feedback I can give you guys, which is at work, you can be as friendly as you want to be, as long as work is always the most important thing at work. So as long as the friendship and the fun and the jokes don't take away from the success of the business. The same way as when I hang out with people from work out of work, friendship should come first and focusing on work should come last, right? So if you're joking with people at work and you're enjoying and customers are walking in and out and you're not focusing on the customer, that's a problem. If you're laughing and customers can hear you in the front, that's a problem, right? If you're joking and hugging and you're just not able to kind of complete your job that day, that's a problem. But if you're doing that and you're exceeding the results in the company and you're selling lots or you're serving really well or you get great customer results, why can't you have fun at work? And that's always been my motto. So for my teams, I tell people, have as much fun as you can, as long as you're exceeding the targets. So maybe keep that in mind when you're, when you're interacting with people. Like if I was the owner, would I be okay with this? And always put that in your head, right? And a big one, I'll give you a great example, okay? When you now go to restaurants, how often does this happen? You go to Cactus Club or Earl's, you walk up to the station, Oh, hi. Hi, how are you? Yeah, welcome. It's like, or two people are chatting. Oh, hi, yeah. That to me is a problem, right? You are paid to support the business. You're the ambassador of the business. Have all the fun you want. But as soon as that door slowly opens, hi, good afternoon, welcome to Cactus Club. For how many today? And so you can be both, making sure the business always comes first at work.
Thank you. Yeah, I always tell people, like, I want people to have great relationships, but at the end of the day, they're paying you to be there, not paying you to hang out with your friends, right? So you can create that balance. So always think, what would the owner want here? Thank you so much, Kelvin. And I appreciate us matching shirts. So thank you. <laughs> I don't know if we have more questions. This is but good. I cannot let this opportunity pass away. <laughs> uh, I would like to ask Kelvin, because you, uh, you have a, a lot of experience in this topic. Right now, for us international students, we have we are in a great opportunity to get our dream job. What are the tips or advice can you give up, give us to plan and or approach to that job? So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Nick this just just so that you guys all your ears perk up and everyone stops what they're doing and they make these notes. So Nick, from the people that have coached with the Montero group, is it true or not that 96% of them get jobs within three months when they, when they coach with us? Is this true? Yeah. Yeah. I got a number from Neil as well. <laughs> yeah. So it is true. Yeah. 90, think about this guys, 96%. So what I'm about to tell you, this works. And the one or two people that didn't get a job, it's because they did not follow the tips. So the first thing is, you must really want this. If you're applying for two jobs a week and you're like, oh, I'm gonna do it on my phone at midnight, and you're not gonna get a great job. This is very simple. Like you're wasting your time, you're wasting your, your, your mindset. Rule number one is you must apply for 25 jobs a week, 25. The reason I always say 25 is if you apply for 25 jobs over four weeks, the math is easy. This is 100 jobs. I can tell you that if your resume is great and it's been reviewed and you have a good cover letter, you'll get at least 5% return. 5% means five people should contact you out of the 100. And that's the worst case. So out of five people, you'll get at least three interviews. From the three interviews, you'll get one to two job offers. You will get the job you want and you will get options because if you're only applying for a few jobs, you're likely only going to have one interview with one company and you're not going to have any choices. Okay. It's my one interview. I better take this job. Nothing else is happening. But if you apply for hundred jobs, there's going to be emails coming in and calls coming in and you'll have options. So my first step for you guys is you must have an aggressive application approach, hundred resumes in a month. Second thing is when you go through to do your applications, you have to take the time to make them good. So personalized cover letters, personalized resumes, you know, it's called garbage in garbage out, whatever you put in, you're going to get out. If you put in the same cover letter for every application, your odds are going to be lower, right? Applying for jobs is like math. There's a system behind it right? The more you do, the better you do it, the higher your odds are to achieve a great job. So make sure you have quality content when you're submitting that. The third thing is when you actually get into the interview and Richard's heard this before, and I know he believes in this, he's gotten a few jobs since we've been working together. You have to make sure when you get to that interview, that you know, the company, that you know, the questions that they're going to ask those five or six common questions. And these questions will always be asked. Tell me a little bit about yourself. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Why do you want to work here? And then the big question that's always asked, and this is proven that it's the reason why most people don't get the job is the last question, which is, do you have any questions for me? You need to have two or three great questions, right? These people are willing to invest 50, 60, 70, $80,000 in you. You better have some questions because if you don't, you're telling the recruiter or the manager that you know everything. So, Hey, tell me a little bit about your path. What, what is it that makes you enjoy working here? Or what is really great look like in a year from now, if I was to get this job, 
make it about them, make it about their development, make it about building the relationship with them. Because if you ask them great questions, you're going to leave on a high note from that interview, right? And then lastly, you have to constantly be bettering yourself. Sessions like these, networking events, going to the ASQ conference, jumping on Eventbrite once a week to connect with different companies, spending time on your LinkedIn so your online profile has a great picture, great tagline, you're following new companies, you're getting recommendations. This is going to build your framework for the next 20 years. So if you've got 20 recommendations, you're following 100 great companies in five years, you now have options. Options is where you want to be in your career. Right? You don't want to get stuck in one job and one boss has all the control over you. LinkedIn and your, and your brand is going to help you build that relationship with the outside world. So I know I, I kind of went off a little bit there, but those are three or four steps I really, really believe in. And I'll finish off by saying you're going to get what you want out of it. So when people say to me, Calvin, I can't find a job, my answer is either you're not trying hard enough or you're looking for the wrong jobs. Those are, those are the only two reasons, right? If you went and got a hospitality degree and you're applying to be a doctor, you're not gonna be a doctor. Or if you're trying to get in to be a GM of a hotel and you have no experience in a hotel, you're not gonna be a GM in a hotel. But if you're applying to be a front desk supervisor and you have a bit of experience in guest services and you work your butt off with your applications and your cover letter and your resume, there is no reason you shouldn't get a job in this market. No reason. Now, keep in mind, guys, this is more important today than ever because you're going to see a big shift in the market. Right now, everyone needs employees, right? You're already starting to see it's doing this because we are in or we're going to be in a recession very soon. So the layoffs are coming. The market spending is slowing down. The bookings for hotels are slowing down. People eating at restaurants is going to slow down movie theaters, everyone's going to stop spending money because of inflation, because of the recession. So you guys want to get in as soon as you can, because there's going to be a big market shift in the next few months. Thank you, Kelvin. Thank you for all those tips that we have to put it in practice. <laughs> and Richard, anyone that goes on Saturday to the ASQ conference, I am talking about 10 tips to building your personal brand. And it's a little bit different. A few of you may have heard that presentation before, but I'm going to give real life examples that you can write down some notes and you can go home and do these things right away. And the, again, it'll just, it'll build your notoriety. It'll build your brand in the marketplace, make it easier to find jobs as well. Great. Great. So yeah, you know, guys, <laughs> try to participate this Saturday. Uh, on behalf of the lead club, we have to say thanks. Uh, Tanya and Monica as our members of the our lead club. Catherine was here, but she has another event. And we have to say thank you also to Nick. He's always here helping us with this type of events. So Kelvin, really appreciate your your time and all your experience. Anytime, guys, and I will put in the chat box. Um, my email, my website, in case you ever want to reach out and have questions, um, you're more than welcome to. And you can always reach out to Nick because in January, we just finished our coaching program for this term. But in January, Ascenda offers 15, 17 students an opportunity to have four coaching sessions with me and my team to help you with your resume, your cover letter, and it's free. Ascenda pays for it. So it's like, not, not, I'm not saying that sessions with me are great, but it's free, so it can't hurt. And so if that's something you're interested in, I think Nick will do a sign up maybe late in December, early January. You can reach out to Nick to join that program. So it's pretty cool. Thank you so much again, Kelvin, for being here. Thank you, thank you so much. It was a really great conversation. Oh, it's my pleasure. I appreciate it. So it's always fun to meet smart people and hopefully inspire you to do a little bit more this evening and tomorrow. That's the goal.